Okay, we are once more here with Mr. Lauriers. Um, we've had conversations about uh, classical ideas. Uh, we've had conversations about classical diagnosis. We've had conversations about classical formulas. Um, and we'd like to we'd like to move on to considering the idea of modification in um, in Chinese medicine and classical Chinese medicine and in the Tian lineage, um, why would one modify a formula? Um, how should one modify a formula? And we would like to start, and if there's time, we'd like to talk a little bit about Western medicine and, and how those two things relate. The first question then, why, why should one modify a formula or when, when would you when would you modify a formula? Um, yeah, I mean, so first the idea of modifying, modifying a formula. So modifications are often talked about a lot as in specific modifications. People teach that a lot. You know, I add this herb for this, or I do this, but a system of modification and structured modification is, is not really taught very much. Um, First of all, what does it mean to modify? It basically means to change a formula in some way. Um, and that can be in any way. It can be through increasing or reducing the dosages of the herbs within the formula. Um, it can be taking out or adding herbs, or it can be even combining two or more formulas together. Um, why would you do this? Well, again, it comes back to your how you apply formulas so if you are seeing your formulas as these kind of key structures which are aimed at restoring key aspects of physiology um i think we used i used an analogy of a map last time that you have and i say like a city let's say in a six confirmation sense you'd have a city then you have six main roads going down at your six confirmation like your main roads on the map and then the side streets are all the other things that link it in between so it's almost like you're you would have let's say six key forms to treat each one of the six confirmations um i mean this is overly simplified for the purposes but that would be your starting point in clinic these six fundamental formulas which treat fundamental disruption of physiology modifications are the variations between all those things so say this the, the streets joining like the little alleyways joining the tying and the angling street that's when you start to modify because you could be bang in the middle between those two streets you know midway between a tying and a yangling pathology a perfect combination of the two um you could be a bit more towards tying be a bit more towards yangling so there you may need to actually start to modify your formula slightly so for example if you were say in a grager tang pattern so again you've been struck from the outside like you're already uh, somebody who tends to a bit more you know, a bit more of a dry interior, a bit more of a blood fish interior. So you yang to a floating bit at the surface, you tend to sweat a bit more easy and so on. You're then struck by wind from the outside. You've developed this kind of mild fever with sweating, body aches and so on. You're then in a, a tying wind strike. Let's say it's been going on a bit longer or the outside environment is a bit drier. Um, so because of that, you've been sweating a bit more. You've lost more fluids to the outside. So the musculature of your neck is starting to tighten up a bit more and it's starting to dry out more. There you're moving to walk more towards the yangling dryness. So you're not yet out of the full guaja tang pattern, but it's not no longer a pure guaja tang. You're now starting to see a little bit more yangling dryness creep in because your muscles are drying out along your neck. So then you may modify by adding, say, the herb gergen to create the formula guaja gia gergen tang. Um, so that would be an example. I mean, that that's already a standardized formula. That would be an example of a modification of changing a formula to treat a variation of a fundamental disruption of physiology. Um, yeah. Now, it's really kind of important to... Th this is why it's so important to really learn your, your basics really well. Because then you'll need to know, because then you learn what is within the realm of what a formula treats um, and what you need to modify for. Because it kind of nowadays, 
it's it's almost like automatic modification. Um, I mean, th there's different schools. For example, Japanese Kampo schools generally don't modify because they they can only prescribe pre-made formulas, so they have to just prescribe modified formulas. But certainly in, in most modern kind of herbal approaches, people just modify it automatically. It's almost like it's it's just standard. You, what's your base formula and what are your modifications? And you very, very rarely hear anybody say, no modifications, I'm not going to modify. Um, the the reason why that's not necessarily a good approach is because automatic modification again it comes back to this idea of how clear and concise you want to be and how how exacting you're trying to be in hitting that mark of what that, that formula treats so if you're automatically modifying in every formula you've got to kind of sort of ask yourself how accurate you are with your diagnosis with your prescribing of your base formula another argument is that everybody's different so therefore everybody needs different formula actually that's that's not really what that means. Everybody's different doesn't mean that there's no such thing as standardized formulas. Every, you know, everybody is different means more that you don't treat every headache with the same formula. You know, the, the mechanism going on in people is different, but it still follows exactly the same rules as every other human. So a Shao Chai Hu Tang pattern in one person will be exactly the same as a Shao Chai Hu Tang pattern in another person. So if you see two people coming in, with the exacting diagnostic criteria of Chao Chai Hu Tang, they, they both need Chao Chai Tang. You don't need to modify just because they're different people. If they, if they displayed something different, they wouldn't show a Chao Chai Tang pattern. Um, but nowadays, modification is really, really automatic. Um, and this was something I had when I was studying as well. It kind of, very early on, I was, um, I kind of had a bit of an issue with this, that we had always, Pick a formula and instantly modify and almost just modify excessively. And I always used to ask, like, if, if this formula treats the, the pathology, why do we need to modify? And I remember for two years, I asked one lecture and, I, you know, I really like this guy. He's a, he's a lovely person. But we always had this back and forth about modification in that I'd always say, you know, why, why are you modifying? And say, oh, because you need more herbs. And I'd say, why? If this formula treats the pathology, why do you need more herbs? Oh, because it's not enough herbs. And it just, you know, just this back and forth all the time. And then eventually, after two years, um, he eventually answered, because I really drew him on it. And he said, if in China you don't modify, people don't think you're very good. Um, that was kind of it. And that, that sort of is the thing. It's nowadays modification is seen as being more advanced, um, you know, being almost like prescribing more complex formulas, being better in that sense. And prescribing non unmodified formulas seen as a bit pedestrian. But the key thing is really, if you if you're able to really identify that mechanism and focus in on that, then you can prescribe unmodified. And actually, clinically, you don't need to try and address every little branch of the problem. The the key I remember something that um, I remember Arno pointed out to me many years ago, and this is when he was talking about his teacher, Doctor Zeng, and he said the one thing he was well, not the one thing, but the thing which he was really really good at was working out exactly what needed to be treated at that point in time and how much could be done at that point in time like the minimal minimal amount you could do to produce the maximum possible result so this again comes down to not overly modifying because and the more you modify also the more symptomatic your treatments generally tend to get because often you're modifying for more of a symptomatic reason so if you can still focus much more on the fundamental mechanism then you can become much more focused. So you don't need to be distracted by trying to chase all these different branches because then your treatment will actually necessarily become less effective and less profound in its results as well. Um, because it loses focus on the important fundamental issue that's going wrong. Yeah, exactly. And you can, and again, it comes back to this idea you're, you're asking the body to do something. You're putting a chemical message into the body, but that doesn't mean the body's necessarily going to do that. The clearer your chemical message is and the more aligned it is with what the body needs to do at that time, the more likely it will do it and the more strongly it will do it. Now, you can write a formula and say it will do this and this and this, but just you saying that and just you writing it doesn't mean the body's going to respond in that way. So you've got to keep that chemical message as clear as possible. And the more convoluted you make it, the less it will do, or possibly the more adverse things it will do. So then what are some of the... Um... I suppose what are some of the uh, the sort of the rules of modifying, but also 
what are what are some modifications that really would have to be made you know what are what are what are necessary modifications but also what are some ways what are some things you should keep in mind about how you modify formulas hmm. so the rules um I mean, openly, we could say rules, we could say structure. Um, again, a lot of people don't like the use of the term rules, but it's, you know, it's a structure. It's, uh, but what are they? They're basically the same rules of physiology. So ensuring you are modifying the mind with physiology, because again, when you're prescribing a formula, you're making a statement about what you think is causing that disease, and you don't want to contradict that statement. So when you modify a formula, for example, if you're giving a guajid tang again, you, to modify that, you'd want to modify in line with a way that pathology can change out of a grage tank. So from a grage tank, giving the example we got earlier, like your, you know, your peripheral musculature could dry out more, which would then get you to a grage geogurgen tank. That that can easily happen. So that's a very tight modification. Or, you know, say if you've lost some fluids from the interior for whatever reason again your more internal musculature could dry out you could get abdominal cramping so you, then you would double the amount of bite that would be very much in line with the grage tank but you wouldn't for example add shirgao to a grage tank especially not like shirgao at 48 grams because shirgao would treat a full-on yangming fever and if you're in a grage tank you by definition are not in full yangming you're not you you could you know if you were overly if somebody mistreated you from a grage tank you could move into like a, a sugar type fever, but then you'd be out of the grage tank. So you wouldn't modify it in that way. Or you wouldn't like do a grage tank and then add loads of damp heat clearing herbs. Because if you're in a grage tank, you are by definition not in a damp heat bed. So you would want you want to modify in in a way that's in line with what could happen from your base formula. And if your modifications have to be so far out of line with your base formula, then you have to think about picking a different base formula because that's already so far off. So the rules are basically just the rules of physiology. That's that's basically it. What can happen from that pathology? What are the variations? And kind of like, what is the, if this is your starting point, what are the variations? And at what point do those variations reach a point where you're no longer working from that base formula? That's that's kind of the key. Do you ever find then in clinic, again, this is kind of a patient question, but I, but I suppose also a practitioner question. Those two mm. things ought to be related. Um, do you find that you have a patient come in, you give them something? I suppose there's a lot of situations. You give them something and you have to sort of jump around uh, to very different formulas. You know, uh, like your diagnosis was off, but it was off considerably. Um, and I suppose the other thing is, you know, you give you give a patient a formula, a lot of things can happen. It could work for a while and then stop working, or it could work for a while and then uh, and then um, and then you find that they've come up with they've come to you and and the picture looks completely different next time. I suppose that's a question about how do you, you know, when do you modify and when do things change or do things change to such a point? that that process that you're talking about doesn't doesn't quite work, you know, like predicting what's going to happen next when a person is given this formula. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, yeah, that. In terms of where people progress, there are, based on where they are now, there's often a likelihood they'll go a certain number of ways um, and a higher likelihood they'll go one way than the other. But then there's also things can just go another way. Like that that can happen. That's because this, you know, this is still a man-made structure in the sense that understanding all of this, the theory is still a man-made structure. It's a very, very tight structure, but there's, there's always going to be degrees of error in there. So there are times when, yeah, often it's quite predictable where someone will go but then there are times when they can just go somewhere else and then you just have to treat it that way and sometimes you you know you're treating somebody they come back in later and you feel the pulse it's very weird it's gone there from there but then you still just have to treat as they present um other times like things can come up in their life you know they can get some kind of infection or do something dietarily or something um which means it, it goes in a weird direction 
that's that's definitely the case um yeah so can the pulse can the i mean the things that direct your understanding of that modification hmm. on the one hand you have this understanding of physiology that tells you from here it makes sense and usually does go in a certain number of directions hmm. and that's related to the to the physiology and therefore to the formula when you check the pulse is the information that it gives you a sort of general information where we're in Guizhou Tang these very and and from Guizhou Tang we know that there's a lot of variations right mm -hmm. like modifications that can be made and then you're just working on the symptoms or as the pulse changes are the all are the changes fine enough that you can make the modification from the pulse if that makes any sense sometimes yes sometimes no I mean, if it's the more the change happens on a kind of deep kind of physiological mechanistic level, the more the pulse will change. If you see what I mean, um, the more kind of superficial peripheral it is, the, the less the less the pulse will change. So sometimes you are going a little bit off symptoms. So, for example, like a Guizhou Tang, the Guizhou Tang pattern with pronounced thirst and absence of aversion to wind or cold would be. Guala Guage Tang or Guage Tang plus Tian Puffin. Now you could theoretically say the pulse would start to change for that as well, but also just a Guage Tang pulse with with those additional symptoms would be enough to then tell you there's that variation. Maybe the pulse hasn't had time to change yet, or there's something else suppressing it. So yeah. Um, but certainly the more fundamental it is in terms of physiology, the more the pulse should change. Okay. So there's a certain kind of event horizon where the, the change is big enough that the pulse is really telling you a direction to go in yeah or like even there's sometimes when it's not for example like Xiao Chai Hu Tang or Zen Tang they all have standardized modifications for cough in the original text now there would be no difference on the pulse there but the patient would present with a symptom for cough of cough so you would modify them based on a patient with a clear Xiao Chai Tang pattern also having a cough so there there, there would be absolutely nothing different on the pulse but that wow. symptom would indicate the need for that modification okay I suppose that brings us to the to the question of I mean it to my mind it it brings sort of the question of um uh, drugs like synthetic drugs right so this is you know <clears throat> you're taking and I think we talked about this in our last conversation you had a parent uh, a patient who had um was it acid reflux or something and she was taking a medicine for it it was helping her symptoms. It did not, in fact, change her pulse because the, the problem remains the same. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find that you have to um, modify a formula because the patient is also seeing a, a, a sort of Western medicine doctor and that doctor has given them uh, something that is changing their pulse or that is changing their symptoms or is changing their symptoms without changing their pulse or any of the the mess that can happen i imagine from that sort of scenario yeah yeah i mean basically like this question comes up a lot about you know pharmaceuticals and how that change your herbal formula how it change your pulse and the old answer is you treat a pharmaceutical as any other influence on the body you once the person is on that you just assess how the body is functioning um i know there are some practitioners out there who try to work out what that pharmaceutical is doing to the body in a Chinese medical sense and then discount that. And I know somebody else who once said that whenever somebody comes to them, um, like if they're able to stop taking a medicine safely, they want them to go off it for a month so they can see what their body's like underneath, which, yeah, I, I'm not advocating that certainly. But um, I, I don't, no, I don't think you have to worry about that. You don't have to try and second guess. Um, like you can... You can develop certain ideas about what certain pharmaceuticals do in general in a Chinese medical way, but you still have to assess each individual. So, for example, if a patient goes on a beta blocker and their pulse becomes very deep, slow and tight, if you're treating that patient on that deep on a beta blocker, you're treating them as if they have a deep, slow, tight pulse because that's what they have. That's what they're taking at that time, and that is affecting the function of their body. You're not going to treat them as if they're not on it, just as if somebody drank 16 cups of coffee a day and was having symptoms related to that. 
you would treat them as if they're drinking 16 cups of coffee a day, not as if they weren't. So you, you treat it as an influence on the body. And if somebody changed their medication, you want to see them as quickly as possible after they've changed it so you can reassess. So you're always kind of following what the body's doing right now. Does the cause of why it's doing that right now clinically is not is not important. I mean, maybe in theory it's important, but like, but for your treatment, it's not. Yeah, because we're always looking at how the body is re reacting to any influences placed on it. Now, let's say like beta blockers, a lot of people on beta blockers will develop a deep, slow type pulse. But if somebody starts on beta blockers and they develop the opposite, I'm going to treat them as the opposite. I'm not going to treat them as they should present because the way anyone reacts to any any influence is based on their constitution. It's you're always treating the interaction between the patient's constitution and the the, the influence on it. So you you don't treat the influence of medications in any in any different way. Take, taking actually a step back, I, I just realized that while we were talking about this, that um, this idea of, you know, there's something happening with the body right now, we seem to be sort of circling around this thought of there's something happening in the body right now, but there's also an understanding of how bodies work in general, right? Um, I heard uh, uh, Dr. Arnaud once talk about something that I do not understand. I mean, I could tell that it was a, a brilliant and intriguing thing, actually. Um, but I would like, I sort of like to, to hear you discuss it a little bit. And this is the question of um, like equivalencies. Um, or even at one point he was talking about, I think a, a patient of his who was taking Shentiwan and then after a while the Shentiwan started not not doing what it was supposed to be doing which didn't make any sense and then he gave him a John Wutang and then and then things started happening and then they went back to Shentiwan and everything was working and I have no idea why anything like that could possibly happen um, but I think it fits into this theme of m like modification or switching formulas depends on the understanding of the body as it is now, but also on the body, um, like fundamentally as a body, as a human body. Does mm -hmm. that make any sense, what I just asked you? Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of, yeah. Is this sort of how equivalencies can happen in a body, in the body or like how- well, How equivalencies can happen and like what it means for two formulas to be related mm -hmm. to each other uh, because yeah. you understand how physiology works in general, so that you know that if you're taking one formula and something is not happening, there's another formula that relates to it in some way that can bring us back on track. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so the subject to equivalency, it's, it's a really important, it's really important to understand theoretically, but it's also in, incredibly valuable clinically. It's one of, once you've got the basics down, equivalency is one of the most valuable things you can learn. And there's many different layers of equivalency. So for example, one level of equivalency is you could have two formulas that treat very similar symptomatic presentations, but due to different causes. Um, so you could have, say like a, a formula which treats um, heat and sweating from the head, but due to yang deficiency. So just pure cold, the little bit of yang is separated from yin and is floating up and out, and that's why the interior is cold. But you could also have form that treats heat and sweating from the head due to blood deficiency a dry interior so there the the blood is not strong enough to hold the yang so then the yang floats out and they would have two different pulses but very similar symptomatic presentations um, so that would be an example of a you know a symptomatic equivalency or for example like you could have again bloating in the center similar similar kind of feeling of bloating upwards poking under the ribs but one formula would have very slow difficult stools the other would have loose stools so one would be due to stagnation mm -hmm. so trapped gas in the digestion creating that the other would be due to cold so then fluids are building up and then they would show in you know could potentially show similar pulses but one key differentiating symptom so you can have you can have done that level then you can have pulse equivalency so two two or more forms that can have very very similar pulses but some differing um symptoms which would define them so a similar mechanism in the body but it creates a slightly different symptomatic picture and all of this is very very useful clinically because one thing is if somebody comes in 
and has a certain pulse, you could have two formulas, but you have one key differentiating question. Like somebody comes in with bloating, you feel this pulse and you go, it's one of these two formulas. You know, it's either a, a dry stagnation pattern or it's, you know, it's a cold damp pattern. So they're bloating either because they're, there's air trapped in their abdomen or because there's just cold fluids building up. So then you say, do you have loose stool or is your stool dry and difficult? And you can differentiate it that way. The other good thing is if your initial formula doesn't work, then you have another option mm -hmm. because the one thing I never want to give the impression of is that anybody ever gets a hundred percent results and gets it right every time. Like if, if a practitioner ever tells you, oh yeah, this, I, you know, I get everyone better with this, or I, I never, you know, <laughs> I never get it wrong. I never, you know, I, all of my patients get better. They are, I was just about to swear, but they're, they're, they're lying to you or they've only ever treated one patient. Um, yeah. So, and I actually feel like there's some pulses where you feel a pulse and it could be no other formula and you're just, you feel it and you're like, yep, it's that. I hate those situations because if I give that formula, the patient comes back the next time and they're not better. I'm like, yeah. what do I do now? So I'm, I much prefer the pulses where you feel like it's this formula, but these two are also possible because then I know that I've got other options. That it could be one of the other equivalencies. So, yeah, you, you can have many different levels of equivalency. You can also have the Shen Chuan Zen Wutang example that you give. Now, they are, you can call them kind of Yang deficient blood deficient equivalencies, um, Jingwei Shanghan equivalencies, functional material equivalencies, where they both, the, the fundamental root of that pathology is a cooling off of the small intestine, like a yang deficiency in the lower. So water metabolism is affected. Basically, fluids are building up. Now, in Zen Wutang, it's just a functional deficiency. The lower has cooled off, so cold water builds up. That's basically it. And then you can get, you know, frequent urination, inhibited urination, swelling, shortness of breath, all those things. That's in the Shanghan Lung because, it, you know, it comes about through simple um, means. Somebody's struck from the outside. There's a failure of yang right to the point where your lower jaw cools off more than metabolism is affected. Now, Shen Chi Wan is a taxation formula, and taxation is basically long-term depletion due to lifestyle factors, um, overwork, excessive sex, um, you know, um, in, inappropriate diet, that kind of thing. So it involves not only functional deficiency, but also material deficiency. You've lost some matter in the body. So what's happening in Shen Chi Wan is you've got the same cold of the lower and the failure of water metabolism, but you've also got a lack of blood in the lower. So where in Zen Wutang, just the lower jaw is just cooled off. In Shen Chiwan, the lower jaw is cooled off, but also the blood has dried out, so there's no blood to hold that warmth in the lower. And what's actually happened is over time, you've, you've overworked. And overwork, remember, function always fails first. So you've depleted your yang, you've made your yang float. Because of that, the lower has cooled down, so it's not metabolizing water. So water is lost out of the body, and blood basically dries out. So the thing that holds your yang in the lower is no longer there so you have both a lack of warmth but also a lack of blood in the lower so you could say well then i thought you said there's cold water accumulating there is basically in the solid realm the bloodstream that's deficient so it can't hold on to the warmth but in the hollow spaces you've got a lot of cold water accumulating so you've got that mixture of fluids accumulating in the lower so you get those same symptoms you know weak urination weak urinary stream inhibited urination swelling shortness of breath but you also have the, the lack of matter. So if you just to put a Zemri tang into that patient, they likely wouldn't be able to hold on to the warmth that you've put in. So that would flare up at it, or it just wouldn't work as well. Um, flip side is if you'd give a Shen Chuan to a Zemri tang patient, they, there would still be the warming of the lower with the futsu and the, the draining out of water with fooling, but you're putting a load of Sheng Di in as well, which builds the blood. And Sheng Di is a lot of like cold, wet material nourishment so in a in a zemu tang patient you're just putting more and more cold water in there and the cooling of the sheng di would actually slow down the warming of the lower as well so you need the sheng di in a in a shen chuan patient because you not only need to put the the warmth in with the food so but you need to put the blood in with the sheng di to actually hold that warmth in the lower now in the situation we, which you've talked about it sounds like something which is quite common in shen chuan patients because um, Shen Chi Wan, you know, it can be used to treat certain more recent things. It can be used for short-term treatment as well. But often it's kind of the, the formula. If there was a representative formula that all men would go towards as they age, it would be Shen Chi Wan. You know, it's like the, the male equivalent of Wen Jing Tang. 
So what can happen with Shen Chuan is you start putting it in and it's quite a nourishing form. It's both nourishing and warming. Mm. So as you warm up the lower, you're also putting in this nourishment with Shengdi. And after a while, the system can just get a bit clogged up. So what I find is quite common is like you may need to clear the digestion after a while or as in the, the case of which you just gave, which I know talked about where he went to his Emu Tang, it's possible you're just putting Shengdi in for a while alongside the food and so on. And then it may get to the point where you're putting a lot of nourishment in with the Shengdi and it's just built up to the point where now the person's lower jaw is just cold and wet enough that now you, you just need to drain off excess fluids for a little while. You just need to revive the yang. You've built blood enough, and now you just need to revive yang with Zemu Tang. You do that, and you drain off a lot of excess water, and after a while, you've drained off enough excess water that then you can get back to the, almost like the blood deficiency again. You can get back to nourishing. But just through the natural course of nourishment, you just reach a tipping point where the body can't absorb any more nourishment, so it starts to cool off a bit more, so the Shen Chuan stops working. So you need to just put in a purely warming functional approach for a little while. You then drain off the excess fluids, and then it goes back to needing to build a bit of blood again. It's just that back and forth that sometimes happens with those kind of formulas. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find then that um, there is more of a need um, for modification or equivalencies with chronic patterns, or do you find that there's, for example, a, a sort of a constitutional uh formula right that a person can be on this formula for for a long time maybe because the illness has developed over a long period of time or maybe because there's a there's a constitutional weakness there um i mean i think uh, all of those options i, mean, I think so <laughs> yeah i mean it is very much dependent upon the person i mean but it, so first is there a constitutional formula people can be on i mean once you've cleared up any overarching pathology there's always some area that we're all we've all got an area in our physiology where we're weak so a constitutional formula would be kind of like where you've cleared up any other pathology and then you're just basically just supporting an area where functions weak um so for some people you know that may be a shen man for other people they may just need a bit of a zen tang other people they may even just need a guaja tang or their digestion may be a bit weak so yeah once other pathology is gone then there's um, that possibility of of a constitutional form. And you could always find something whether somebody needs to take it or not. You know, somebody's system may just be working fine. They don't need it. Other people may just do better with a bit of that. Um, in terms of modification in chronic cases, again, it, it very much depends. Like people could be chronically in a Shao Chai tank unmodified or chronically in a Zemu tank. That could certainly be the case. Or they could be chronically in a um like a, a pattern that needs a combination of zen tang and just sheer vibration don't mm -hmm. they just have that chronic stuckness in the bowels along with that chronic cooling off of the lower so there's no absolute on that really um mm -hmm. the certainly what you can do with more stable pathologies mm -hmm. so issues that have gone on long term and aren't quickly changing you can work with building things up a bit more, which is kind of how I like to work with more stable pathologies in that I can, if a patient comes in, say, with a chronic thing, um, and I can see, I can identify what the core kind of fundamental issue is, but I can see other areas where I can modify for that. What I like to do is start off as unmodified as possible mm -hmm. because some things do just take time to treat. So if I know somebody's likely to be on thing, something for a period of time, I may start off as modified, as unmodified and as clear and simple as possible, and I can always build up from there. And what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to get clear feedback from the start, and then I'm going to see whether I need to modify it. And if I need to modify, I can do it gradually. So I'm just working through clear steps with a person. Um, and especially with a new patient, it's always good to be like that because, you know, there are these, there are clear like physiology is structured there are clear rules to it and so on but again we're working with people and it's the variables that make it hard so the clearer you can be with a newer patient the clearer the feedback is so yeah with with more stable chronic conditions if i can the simple i'll always try to be as simple as possible because you can always build up from there if you start off complex then the feedback you'll get will be confusing yeah so with the mention i suppose of um 
Shai Shai Utani. I really, one of the things that I honestly, I don't even know if I understand it completely, but um, one of the things that I really love about this um, classical approach in general, whether it's the Tian lineage or otherwise, is even as a patient, you know, it's, you get, people are like, oh, this patient needs to be cooled off. This patient needs to be warmed up. And honestly, for a very, like for decades, I was just thinking to myself as a patient, I'm like, what if I need both? Like, what if I need both at the same time? Um, and it just seemed like a silly idea. It seemed like a silly patient idea, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I, I guess I heard, um, it's, you know, people who, when I kind of got onto this kind of classical thing, um, this idea of harmonization, I think, was just is just really fascinating to me. Can you? I guess that's one that's one question that's inspired by Shao Chai Yutang, right? And then the other one is, well, actually, let's answer that one first. What is this idea of harmonization, and why why does it not why does it not get used? I feel like it gets used a bit systematically, almost in 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 the classical thing. There's almost like a like a rule of thumb. Not necessary, not necessarily, but it's like harmonizing at the beginning might be a good idea. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so harmonizing, this is, when we talk about harmonizing, we're specifically talking about the treatment of a Xiaoyang disease. Now, there are mentions in the Shanghai Lun where it talks about harmonizing, neutral and protective with the Gray Tang and so on. We're not talking about that there. Like we're, we're talking about the treatment of Xiaoyang disease. Um, now, Xiaoyang is still a yang confirmation, so it's still an excess pattern, but it's the least yang of the yang confirmations. So it's the most deficient you can, or it's it's like the the least excess you can be while still being in the yang confirmation, while still being in the excess pattern. Um, Try not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but when you say, you know, like people always talk about warming and cooling, but sometimes people need both. It's, yeah, it's more common that people kind of need that mixture because all disease comes about primarily due to a failure of function, a failure of yang. And there's no such thing as, um, you know, an excess of yang. It just can't happen because at Tai Yang, you are at the most yang you can have. And then from there, progression through the sixth confirmation is a failure of function. You go from Tai Yang, the biggest yang, into yang ming into xiaoyang it's a depletion of yang or, or a failure of function xiaoyang is the last place you can be while still being in in the hollow organs in the excess before you get to the point where actually you don't have enough yang to support the function of your solid organs and that's what it means to progress from xiaoyang to tai yin or from an excess to a deficient state that you you no longer have the yang to support the function of your your solid organs or the function of solid organs is starting to fail so showing is just a step before that the difficulty with the showing disease is that um it's a it's a starkness of the the ministerial fire or you know the the lesser fire which radiates from the heart also you know known as chi it's basically a starkness of that warmth in the hollow spaces of the body because that warmth should be circulating around the body you know providing warmth to everywhere supporting functions it should be really moving from top to bottom because strong yang descends, yang is born on top, it should descend into the lower. So this should be descending. An issue with Xiaoyang is your yang has got so weak that your yang is not strong enough to descend through the Sanjia, so it gets stuck and it flares back up. So you have this issue that a Xiaoyang disease is a disease of flaring heat, but it's a weak heat. And its, it's primary symptoms are yang symptoms are heat symptoms, you know, bitter taste in the mouth, sore and dry throat, dizzy vision, redness of the eyes, fullness in the chest, fixation. These are all from line 263, 264, 265 of the Shanghai Lun. But this is where pulse diagnosis comes in. Line 265 says the pulse is thin and wiry. Thin and wiry are yin qualities. So it's yang symptoms with a yin pulse, which tells you this is the lesser yang. So you would think that, that if you're having all these symptoms of flaring heat, you would need to clear heat. You'd need to cool the person down. But the problem is, this is Xiaoyang. This is lesser Yang. You're here because you have very, very little Yang. And if you clear heat, if you extinguish that last bit of Yang, what you do is you send somebody into the Yin confirmation. You damage their last bit of Yang, which is supporting the function of their solid organs. You damage that, you're going to send them into a deficient pattern, which is one thing as a practitioner you should never do. The next thing is you're going to say then, well, let's strengthen their Yang. 
Well, the problem is you can't really do that because the San Joe is blocked and the Yang, you know, the weak Yang is flaring up. So, I mean, you could maybe give them mass amounts of punch and hurt, but it would be horribly uncomfortable. It costs loads and loads of flaring. And maybe you could persist with it and eventually things would rectify, but you would you would actually lose a lot of Yang. You'd dry a lot of blood in that process and it would be incredibly uncomfortable. It'd be like trying to clear a tra traffic jam by driving a bulldozer through it, basically. Um, you may clear it, but it would take a long time and all the peripheral damage would be so unbearable. So you have to do this technique called harmonization, which means you actually have to help the proper descent of the Sanja whilst supporting tie-in, while supporting the earth underneath to stop that from pulling off, to stop the progression to tie in. So you have to do a little bit of descending downwards and inwards with a little bit of supporting of physiology underneath. So the herbs you use for that, the primary herb used for this is Huang Qin. Um, you know, if we're going to the technicalities of it, Huang Qin is a bitter, neutral herb. Mm. People said later it's very cold, but actually in the Shenang Ben Sao Jing, it's neutral. And that's very important because you don't want to use really cooling herb methods for the reasons that I've just explained. You'll damage the yang and send a person into tie and you'll damage the earth underneath, you'll damage the next step. But you do want a bit of flavor to actually just help this stuck fire descend through the sanja. But you don't, want, again, you don't want a really heavy bit of flavor because, again, you don't want to cause too much damage to the earth. So you're using huang chin, which is a thin bit of flavor. And because it's a thin bit of, you know, it just goes to the top bit of the fluid layer, which is where the minister of fire is flaring out of. And you're just grabbing that fire and pulling it down and in. Underneath that, you're supporting the tai yin center um, with methods like Cheng Zhang Ban Sha, Ren Shen, uh, Dat Sao, Jurgen Sao, combinations of those formulas. So harmonization is basically this, this approach of gentle descent and encouragement of correct movement of the weak ministerial fire without damaging it while supporting the, the um, physiology underneath. And this is very important because a lot of times... People are misdiagnosed as excess heat because Shang can appear quite hot symptomatically. Very much like, like we always use the analogy that if you have a cigarette lighter, um, you know, if you imagine the ministerial fire moving throughout the body, it's a small fire. And finally, it keeps moving, it keeps the body gently warm. But if it gets stuck in one place, even that small fire can produce a massive amount of heat. So if you get a cigarette lighter and you move it gently over your skin, it will gently warm and it won't burn. But if you hold it in one place, it will burn badly. Um, so often these flaring signs can be misdiagnosed as a lot of heat which needs to be cleared but again the systemic signs won't show that the pulse will not show that the excretions generally won't show that um, so often it's misdiagnosed as a lot of heat and, and, and attack too much which can send people into tie in you see this a lot when people get sore throats and it's diagnosed as wind heat they're giving very cool and herbs sore throat goes away like that but they end up with loads of phlegm and digestive issues and so on it basically damaged tie in now mm -hmm. nowadays it's much safer to do that because we live you know in nice warm houses with abundant food and so on but in the han dynasty that would have been very damaging it's still better not to do it nowadays um it's also often misdiagnosed as people being too yin deficient or too hot to take warm pungent herbs because again xiao yang is the lesser yang so although it can present big heat symptoms it can also present very subtle heat symptoms and the pulse can actually be quite weak so it can appear like a deficient patient you give them a warming approach you warm the solid organs that gives much more yang into the sand gel, which is blocked so that causes a massive flare of heat so these patients will, will often be diagnosed as being too yin deficient or too hot to take hot herbs so then the practitioner will often just go back to loads and loads of cooling and you know may may not get anywhere so harmonizing is a very you know it's a very important thing to just relieve that bit of stuckness in the sand gel, open up the circulation of warmth and fluids throughout the body so that then you can get in and treat sort of organs once you remove the stuckness in the sand gel. um you can also like I say deal with a lot of big heat symptoms without damaging the yang of the body um yeah i mean showing yang diseases are also damp heat diseases because the that that warmth circulating in the sand gel is that ministerial fire is contained within the earth nutritive so it is by definition a damp heat when it gets stuck in flares those are damp heat diseases and again damp heat is a combination of damp which is yin and heat which is yang so damp heat is already not a lot of yang it's still a lesser yang condition but it can present with a mass amount of heat so damp heat can stay around longer than a dry heat and can present with bigger heat symptoms and it a good analogy for this is if you imagine warming up like 
boiling like a, a pot of thick soup and a pot of boiling water. Now you bring them both to the boil, both of those fluids will be really hot. You turn the flame off, you come back in five minutes time, the boiling water will have cooled down. All that heat would have left. The soup will still be really warm. Mm. So just like in your body, a little bit of warmth trapped in thick fluids can hang around for a long, long, long time. They can be very chronic conditions. The second thing is um, it can appear much hotter. You know, again, if you, if we had um, a thick soup and then just an empty saucepan, you know, damp heat versus a dry heat, if we heated them both up for the same amount of time and then turned the flames off and I said to you, stick your hand in one of those two pots, you'd stick your hand in the one without any liquid in. Like obviously without touching the pot, but that that hot air will have left. It won't present as big a heat symptom. If you stick it in the hot soup, it will burn your hand. So a damp heat can appear very hot because it's heat stuck in one place and it can go on long term. But again, it doesn't necessarily need massive cooling. And the very fact that it's damp heat tells you it's a very yin pattern already. So again, massive cooling will often then damage the already damp weak earth underneath. So it's very important to understand the need to harmonize. And it's also just very, very common that people collapse into Xiaoyang. You know, if you've had long-term infections, which have gone unresolved, if you, you know, if often if you had a bit of antibiotic treatment or so on, you may collapse into Xiaoyang. That's not saying antibiotic treatment is bad. It just will often send people there. You know, if you've had a poor diet, which is weakening your digestion, basically any time you have an unresolved chronic Yang confirmation condition, and you're strong enough to keep it out of your solid organs, you will probably have collapsed into Xiaoyang. So it's very, very common that you need to harmonize patients at some point along the treatment. It's very common actually early on you need to do it. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that kind of answered the... It did, it did. Um, yeah, seen this might be a good um, place, I think, to be on the mention of chronic issues um to ask them to bring these two kind of streams that we've been talking about together and ask about like the question that you wanted to ask about chronic issues and uh and and their sort of their western names and and their and their chinese the chinese approach to that the mm -hmm. chinese medicine approach to that that does actually yeah, man, it just does just uh, just sort of kind of another point which i think is important which just not from harmonizing if if you don't mind me yeah, please. So, no. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again, this idea that, you know, the body is a dynamic changing thing and it changes with treatment. So again, this idea of what I said earlier, like sometimes people who have kind of a bit of chronic st Xiaoyang stuck there, you give them warm herbs and they flare a bit. And then this person is labeled as, you know, too yin deficient or has internal heat, so they can't take hot herbs. Uh, it seems like often now diagnosis in Chinese medicine can sometimes be seen as a bit like labels, like people say, oh, I'm spleen chi deficient, as if that's what I always am, and that's, or I have liver chi stagnation, I'm always that. And you see this as well, like this person's too yin deficient to take hot herbs, or this person has heat. And actually, it's changing. So even if there is a, say, if you tried to warm somebody up, and there was a, they had a flare of heat as a result of that, that doesn't mean that they are never going to need hot herbs, and they're never going to be able to take a certain treatment. And this is the thing, that's a good example. Like that patient, you harmonize them, you regulate their system, or you alter the function of their system, they can then take hot herbs. So they are not always stuck in, in that pattern of spleen sheet deficiency, of heat, of yin deficiency, or whatever. This is a constantly changing thing. And I think sometimes that like Chinese medical like diagnosis sometimes become a bit like fixed patterns in some people's minds, which they're not. I think it's important to remember and harmonize like. Just the fact that you brought up harmonization just kind of reminded me of that point because this is something where it just shows often you 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 need to regulate a certain bit of physiology then you can move on to the next and sometimes an unregulated bit of physiology can stop you treating the other things and sharing is a very good example of that it's something very common you need to treat in people because you regulate that and that opens up an avenue to treat so many other deep underlying things so yeah, it's just it's just getting at that, remembering it's a, you are working with a dynamic body, and that's the whole basis of Chinese medicine. Change and understanding change through time is the whole basis of Chinese medicine. So thinking about patients as stuck diagnosis as they are spleen chi deficient with liver chi stagnation is again kind of missing the point of Chinese medicine a bit. I suppose like there's also this issue that you mentioned. If we're gonna stick with just the pure sort of Chinese medicine aspect of this for a second before um Yassim brings those two things together, but it also seems that, you know, we've mentioned frequently, uh, you know, that these confirmations are sort of paired, 
Mm. And so, you know, if you have a, I, I think you said that the kind of the, 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 the Shaoyang is paired with Jue Yin and that those two things are related somehow. And I suppose one is a Yang confirmation and one is a Yin confirmation. And those, the, the, the how does the relationship between those two things work in terms of this kind of tracking of change that you were talking about? That a person could be in a Shaoyang and then it sounds like very smoothly we could get into talking about Jue Yin treatment for the same patient. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, a confirmation fails because it's <clears throat> paired confirmation fails, basically. It, it failed. So, for example, with Tai Yang, Tai Yang is cold water of the north. The warmth of Tai Yang comes from its paired confirmation, Shaoyan Imperial Fire. So the heart, the, sha the heart, which is part of Shaoyan, supplies the warmth to Tai Yang small intestine to supply the warmth to the Tai Yang system. So, yeah, um, often after treating one, after treating, say, clearing the excess, you then may need to go in and support the head yin confirmation. Shaoyang Jue Yin is a very good example of that because ultimately the way you get out of chronic Shaoyang is to start to build Jue Yin, start to move the blood and ensure there's healthy, warm blood circulating because it's the, the, the warmth radiating from the blood that produces the ministerial fire. And we see this in Jingwei chapter one where it says that, you know, the is infused with blood chi. Um, and so Xiaoyang function fails because ministerial fire is weak. Ministerial fire is weak because Jiayin blood is not radiating enough warmth into the Sanjia. So to, to kind of truly harmonize Xiaoyang, you have to start rectifying the function of Jiayin at the same time. And also once you're out of Xiaoyang, it's likely then you will need to get in and, and build the deficient aspect, the, the deficient, um, the, the paired confirmation. So start to build the up the deficiency of drain so you don't just go back into the showing you know what i find this is the this is the last this is the last that i'm going to say i think it's th there's a thing that if you if you go through the internet as i think all uh as i think all sick people these days do you know our closest relationship is with google we have an anxiety relationship um there's there's this kind of um how do i put this like an impression that somehow um chinese medicine i'm thinking specifically of like sort of the the discussions about the kidney especially i don't know if this is the thing that you've kind of come across uh but it's like it's like y you have a certain amount of kidney like um like Jing, say, or like Yin or, or Yang, and it's wasting away. And like once, and you know, and once that happens, there's nothing really anybody can do to help you. And there's something about the way that you're talking that's, that's kind of in this sort of cycle that is, I think, much more hopeful. You know, that you can, these things depend on each other. And so therefore, there's always a way to sort of move forward towards health from wherever you are and back, I suppose. Um, is that a difference that you find between maybe a TCM and the classical approach? Is there a historical reason for that? Is there a theoretical reason for that? Is it something that you've noticed at all, really? Yeah, yeah, I think there's... Yeah, there's, there's a big difference there, and I think that's something... We kind of touched on it before. I'll try to keep this brief because I feel there's aspects of things there we could do a whole episode. On yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ultimately, yes, it's true. You are. So the coming together of yin and yang is what gives birth to life. Um, the, you know, the yang animates the yin, the yin holds the yang. If those two things aren't happening, there isn't life. And yeah, you are born with a finite amount of imperial fire of the heart, which mm -hmm. is your yang. And basically jing the substance of the kidney from which all the, the matter is kind of drawn and then that's supplemented by your post having what you eat and drink afterwards now the whole thing about whether the heart is source yang or comes from the kidneys i mean it's the heart basically <laughs> but um i know there's a lot of debate about that and especially from even from you know the time then jing was written they started talking about ming men which is just a small intestine um there's a lot of debate about that but anyway that's that's a topic for another episode but mm -hmm. basically there isn't there 
there's a finite amount of imperial fire. Basically, Yang. There's a finite amount of well, I mean, like Yang isn't a substantial thing as such, but there's a finite amount to produce function in the body. You mm -hmm. you know, at some point your heart will stop beating, basically. And there's a finite amount of kidney jing. How you live, how you eat, and so on will depend on how quickly you kind of burn that off. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you live a very like the whole idea of a lot of Taoist practices is to conserve all of that as much as possible. If you live a very outgoing life, lots of, you know, stimulant drugs over, you know overactivity lack of rest you'll burn that off quicker and so on mm. if so th there is that but, but yeah it's definitely nowadays things have become very materially focused so they're constantly focusing on the matter you have in your body mm. um you know how much in you have how many fluids you have and so on whereas classically things are much more functional they're like is there enough is there enough function like the matter is there you're you're less likely to be significantly materially deficient um we're just looking at supporting function providing the structure can allow that function to happen then we we try to support function as much as possible and yeah that i mean the the thing is it's people are not going to be significantly material even like jing deficient generally like it's it's an overdiagnosed thing they're just not going to be that materially deficient to the point where the structures can't support a function and if they are to be honest with you there's not much can be done about that really like if it is genuine genuine mm -hmm. jing deficient and even if somebody say is jing deficient they have like a hereditary issue which means certain things are underdeveloped you're very unlikely to be able to change that but what the one thing you can support is function you can try and support function as much as possible within that structure so yeah definitely classical medicine is focused on supporting the function to the extent that it can possibly take place more modern approaches are much more focused on the material aspect and do definitely overdiagnose jing issues and overdiagnose kidney deficiency mm. most of the time the kidneys strictly speaking can't be in excess because they're a solid organ you can't have excess solid organs but the water element is generally in excess more often than not definitely not in deficiency i mean we, we are like the, the whole idea that people are so materially deficient we live in a time of abundant calories with an obesity epidemic in the west like mm -hmm. certainly in the West, mm -hmm. patients we treat are they may be lacking quality of nutrition, but they're not lacking a quantity of matter. That's mm -hmm. more of a problem than lacking it. You know, mm -hmm. it's the Han dynasty would have been a time when you would you would be more likely to see those material deficiencies. And it's interesting in the Tang Yijing, you see some formulas for treating great taxation. There are formulas for each one of the solid organs, and it's basically a formula. And then in that, you throw in a bit of the organ meat that's. Um, <laughs> that's there and so the also the formulas for taxation in the jingwei a lot of them like xiao jen song tang you add in e-tang which is basically malt syrup you know so that's giving somebody basically a sugar hit in a time where then it was no refined sugar or that was your only refined sugar so this is clearly treating people who are significantly nutritionally deficient in a way you just aren't nowadays so yes yeah, it's, it's just no very emphasis on on material things nowadays which where we what we actually need is much much more function Okay. I, yeah go on yes yeah okay um well i just feel i i was looking for an, an eloquent sort of bridge to tie us to get us into the next um set of questions when i feel like we've got there by talking about um function um particularly as opposed to material damage um we've also touched on other points um in this session um when we were talking about harmonization, which preceded this, 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 you know, which we just have just just had this uh, conversation about harmonization, and so I want to get to, um, I want to get talking, and of course we were talking about harmonization, and we were talking earlier even about effects of certain pharmaceutical drugs and so on and so forth. So I'd like to get to come directly back to biomedical diseases. Um, and I would like to um, take as an example, since we are talking about function and we have touched on certain chronic issues already, um, maybe an autoimmune disease and as an example, whether uh, Graves or rheumatoid arthritis or whatever you think would be best uh, in this case, and maybe a pr maybe um, look at how um the tn lineage um would approach these issues um 
Right. The very basic question, I guess, would be: Does 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 that disease name mean anything to you? Um, and if it does, then how would it fit in with the pulse and uh, other elements of this of the Tian lineage that we've talked about in this session and uh, even in last session when we were talking specifically about the pulse? Mm. Yeah. Um, so. when it yeah when it comes to um looking at things from a the perspective of a biomedical diagnosis i mean for a start that's what patients come in and present with so you know naturally that's always going to be in your mind but i think the the important thing is that that's first when you assess a patient um I think you should always look to first assess them from a purely Chinese medical perspective and then bring that information in later as additional information. Um, because you certainly can see tendencies in certain biomedical conditions from a Chinese medical perspective. So, and this is sort of what TCM kind of tries to do <laughs> a lot. They kind of try to say, well, this Western medical condition will be these one to three Chinese medical diagnosis, um, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis, there'll be a cold, damp B syndrome, obstruction syndrome, or hot, damp, and so on, or like something like that. So, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad teaching structure, but if you start from that position, you end up just boxing yourself into protocol-based treatment and in, in, you, you end up fitting the patient into diagnosis because you then have an idea that rheumatoid arthritis has to be one of those three patterns and you try to force the patient into whichever one is more appropriate and you end up just getting back to basically a, almost like a biomedical disease differentiation anyway so i think it's best to especially in your learning of chinese medicine it's best to start off learning how to diagnose a patient from a pure chinese medical perspective first and then later you can look at these tendencies. So we do treat um, clinical strategies for certain biomedical diseases, but that comes at the end of our training. And I do a lot of kind of additional supplementary lectures like that, but only once patients have learned the basic diagnostic criteria. So let's say, for example, you, there's condition X, which could present as a Xiaoyang disease or a Taiyang disease or something like it, it commonly presents as those, but then a patient comes in and has a pulse that doesn't match any of those. You still have to have the Chinese medical diagnostic capabilities to still prescribe a form, which doesn't fall into any of like the common structures mm. or for example, rheumatoid arthritis patient. Now rheumatoid arthritis is quite a good example because there's actually a mass amount of overlap between the Jingwei disease category of Li Jie Bing which I think we talked about earlier, digest and articulation disease, which is basically long-term chronic problems of the small joints of the body, the digits and articulations, um, where there is pain, swelling, stiffness, um, also with swelling of the lower legs and so on. So I think the classical disease of Legia being they were actually described in rheumatoid arthritis, but it doesn't have to be a diagnosis for rheumatoid arthritis. So, you know, you can that's a very clearly definable pattern very clearly links to to the western medical disease category but you could have a patient who comes in who uh, their rate that uh, their root may need a um a Lee Jie Bing formula but at that current moment in time there's other stuff going on on top and they're presenting as a Xiaoyang formula now you have to be able to diagnose a Xiaoyang pattern in that patient because that's what they need at that time and that may relate to their autoimmune disease that may be a stimulation of the immune system and harmonizing xiaoyang will regulate that and therefore um, help their joint pain which it is very very common or it could be something completely unrelated which needs to be sorted out first or it could be a combination of un an unrelated thing on top of a related thing and you basically still have to be able to treat that that complex of um of influences so yeah, I mean, as, as a teaching tool, you can definitely do that. You can definitely draw equivalent disease and map out very, very common tendencies in treatment. But I don't think that's where the teaching should start. That should be the last bit. That's more to kind of streamline clinic once the other stuff's become so automatic. Because 
you know, we could say, like you, you brought up Graves' disease, we can look at autoimmune thyroid issues. Um, you know, Graves' disease is an autoimmune thyroid issue where there's more of a tendency to overactive thyroid. Um, I generally tend to say overactive and underactive rather than hypo and hyper because it's very like that hypo and hyper are so close that if you have a bit of glitch in the sound, you can really get it. So I always say overactive and underactive. But, you know, Graves' disease, there's that tendency to overactive thyroid. Um, you can start to develop, you know, a goiter and so on. Hashimoto's also autoimmune thyroid condition, more of a tendency to underactive. Now, you know, in Graves' disease, people can often get, you know, that greater feeling of body heat, that feeling, you know, really wired system, swelling of the eyes, difficulty sleeping, palpitations, hot sweats, and so on. Um, you know, symptoms which are very familiar to people with overactive thyroid because that's what's producing symptoms. So it's like... Um, you, you can fit that into certain disease countries. Like you can say that's in excess. That could be a Xiaoyang issue. That could be a Xiaoyang Yangming issue. Um, then in deficiency, you can definitely see that as a Xiaoyang issue, a heart kidney not communicating, a Jiayin issue, and so on. You can fit it into all of these, these patterns based on the symptomatic presentation, but it still has to come back to the pulse. And you can, you can have two people who present with exactly the same symptomatic presentation. And I've seen it's like I've treated a lot of, Graves' disease, a lot of Hashimoto's, a lot of autoimmune thyroid issues. Now, I, I think it's something which I found Chinese medicine is exceptional for. Um, and I've had people who have come in with, you know, large going to like extreme heat and sweating, rapid heart rate. And depending on their pulse, they may need something like a dueling tank, which is flushing a lot of hot fluids out of the system, like a, a real fluid cooling formula. Or they may need something like a Zemu tank, purely warming to root the yang, which is floating on top. And their pulses will be completely different. And if you just look at it the way these thyroid issues are taught now, you're taught hyperthyroid or overactive thyroid is generally an excess of yang. And you should always be cooling and reducing yang. Underactive thyroid is a deficiency of yang. Now, I've, I've got to be honest with you, I found that overactive thyroid is actually somebody who's losing their yang very quickly. And it's not uncommon that you need to regulate a bit of um, yang confirmations on top, but actually you can still, they can still manifest those massive symptoms of yang leaving whilst their pulse is showing a really deficient condition. And what you actually need to do is you need to build their yang, often their yang and blood and root that yang and just constant cooling will damage that yang further and make it float even more. The kind of analogy I can give for the system is that an overactive thyroid is a thyroid that's being forced to work too much. Things can be forced to work too much either because something is pushing on it to work too much or because something is weak, so therefore it's having to work harder and harder or it, or it has the feeling that it's weak, so it has to put more and more and more and more output. Um, if something is putting out a really high output and you weaken it further, it's going to put out an even higher output, if you know what I mean. It's like, imagine it as if, you know, like somebody who's running, Two people are running, one with one with long legs is taking big long strides, very relaxed pace, and is covering a large amount of ground. Somebody with short legs have to take loads of short steps. If they want to cover more ground, they have to speed up even more and run even harder. And it's almost like like that. It's almost like the thyroid is putting out a massive, massive amount of output and you weaken it further. So it has to put out even more output. So in those patients that present as deficiency with floating yang on top, creating more output of the thyroid, if you clear heat. If you clear that superficial heat it just means the body will have to put out even more output to maintain the previous levels it was at in those patients actually need warming and strengthening strengthening something to calm it down just as if your mind you know when you're really tired your mind races because you can't focus clearly you can focus better with a good night's sleep it's that same kind of thing sometimes you need to strengthen somebody to calm down function because x like strong yang doesn't mean excess it means focus it means strong yang descends it means well-rooted solid function very much like somebody with a strong heart their pulse will slow down a bit mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of actually maybe a bit of a better analogy for the overworking analogy you know it's like often nowadays a rapid heart rate is associated with heat which it can be but actually yang deficiency can produce a rapid heart rate as well and that's very common so if somebody comes in with a rapid heart, it doesn't necessarily mean heat. It just means the heart is having to beat faster. And it can be because the heart is weakened. So mm -hmm. say if with each beat, the, the heart could, you know, pump the blood, say, like 
this far when it's strong. If it's weak and it can only pump it this far. Right. Yeah, it would need to beat twice as many times per minute to get the blood as far. So as you weaken the heart more and more, it would have to speed up. So you actually see that with with children a lot in classrooms. Um, I teach older children, but um, every now and then I teach younger children. I always notice this. They they actually are. They get more and more hyperactive the more tired they are. Yeah, that's just that's, a fact, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That is exactly it. Yeah. The system um, does that. It overacts when it's tired because it has to maintain function well, and it it's not as good as regulate not as good at regulating its function. So mm -hmm. that's why I find with a lot of autoimmune overactive thyroid or even just non-autoimmune overactive thyroid if you know once you've like harmonized you got through that then actually really building the yang is what helps the thyroid calm down and get it back to normal levels whereas often you're told to stay away from those kind of methods when there's overactive thyroid because they equate again it's this this um kind of very superficial level of an idea of integration like oh this person looks hot therefore they excess yang it's like well no let's look at the mechanism underneath and mm -hmm. then we can start to think about integration yeah. that is that is interesting i think which i suppose historically makes sense you've got two two systems with a long history of building up their own ideas the first attempts at making those things correlate with each other is always going to be a little superficial and then it'll take time to really see what's going on underneath yeah. structures and if you're going to teach people really quickly, which is what TCM was originally designed to do, to teach people to a basic level really quickly, you're going to say, if somebody shows heat, clear the heat, because that may produce symptomatic response, but also it takes a bit more training and a little bit to to understand the mechanisms underneath to say, if somebody sees heat, that could actually be cold. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And actually more often than not, it will be, because if you're seeing heat, it means Yang is leaving and that person is cooling down. It, if you're seeing heat, it doesn't mean that person's hot. It means that person is cooling down outwards. So their interior will be cold. So there's uh, always the mutual exchange of location of yin and yang. If one area is hot, another area will be cold. If one area is dry, another area will be wet. And this way you see a lot of people come up with these diagnoses of like, they'll say, oh, like, I've got a you know 60-year-old guy coming in. He's got insomnia with night sweats. Like his, his head feels hot, his feet are cold. So he has to wear socks in bed, but he has night sweats. Um, he's thirsty, but he has to urinate at night. So this is yin and yang deficiency. And it's like, no, it's not yin and yang deficiency. He has abundant, clear urination. He has to get up at night to urinate. <clears throat> you know, he's um, got weak, floating yang at night. This is actually just yang deficiency. The reason he's showing dryness on top is because the yang in the lower is weak, so it's not steaming fluids up to contain the yang on top and pull down. So actually... You don't need to tonify any yin. The fact he's got abundant clear urination, cold feet tells you he has abundant yin in his body. It's just not being metabolized because he doesn't have enough yang. Hmm. So it's that thing you're seeing heat on top, cold below. That yeah. doesn't, you know, that that just means you need to get the yang down and in. You don't need to tonify yin in any way. Yeah, but it's well, much quicker. Yeah, I mean, I think even we can understand that that's a thing that would take a little bit more experience to like to 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 that to be your kind of one of the things that comes to your mind immediately it's not an immediately yeah yeah but i also uh, don't think it takes that much more it just needs to be taught in the right way mm -hmm. that's the thing if you if you've gone through the, that kind of training so you see things that then it takes a long time to untrain that but if yeah. you can train somebody from the start in to understand things in a mechanistic way it takes a little bit longer but it doesn't take too much longer if you're teaching somebody the right way from the start that makes sense. I suppose yeah. then you're you're working off the experience of of other people. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be good to. This seems like a good time, and I think this will be our last question. Um, how has how has all of this um, sort of manif manifested itself in? This sort of uh, the past couple of years with this COVID business, right? Like trying to understand something, you know, there's arguments, you know, is it a completely new thing? Is it not? Western medicine seems to be like, we don't really understand what's going on. Uh, they're working on it. I guess they're doing well. Um, and I've, I've seen a few things where Chinese medicine people are exchanging information. The information came out of China and, and then uh, people tried using it here. Is is it a fundamentally different thing just in your experience in clinic? You know, I'm, I'm not asking you to actually tell us what COVID is. I don't think anybody knows that. 
I'm just saying the way that you've experienced it, just as somebody who's, uh, you know, trying to understand it from a Chinese medicine perspective, a classical Chinese medicine perspective, how does it look to you? From a Chinese medical perspective, it's absolutely nothing new. Um, so the COVID virus is new, yes, but the body it's affecting is not new and still works according to the same rules of physiology as before. And again, we're we're looking at how the system is failing, not at what's affecting the system. So, and I, I honestly found like there was nothing new in the disease progression that you saw in COVID people. Now, certain stages were emphasized and certain stages progressed a lot quicker than others, but there was nothing new in the actual disease presentation. So it's still exactly the same rules. It didn't have to come up with any new formulas. And I treated quite a few people, and I found like quite a few people in that stage just pre-hospitalization, you know, when you get the severe chest or severe shortness of breath and oxygen saturation starts to dip. I got quite a few people at that stage and was able to treat them and stop them from going to hospital where, you know, it's that stage just where it's starting to get worry so yeah treat a lot of people and then long covid seen a lot of people with that and yeah it's it's kind of shocking how debilitating it can be nothing yeah. kind of again long covid is so varied but nothing i haven't found anything where you need to look for something new outside of chinese medicine you just see a greater prevalence of certain things than others um but not not anything new basically which mm -hmm. kind of no, yeah you go yeah. no please which kind of what um yeah it just kind of i don't want to sound overly critical but it did kind of there were certain i saw it a bit not everybody but like there was a certain prevalence of people kind of again almost exposing that the the basic methods to analyze disease are not taught so a lot of people saying what what do i do for covid it's like well apply the diagnostic methods you have and you should be able to work it out i mean it's still five elements six confirmation it's still the same zhang fu they still work with the same method. so you're seeing how that function is failing no matter what is causing it a you know a shao shen chong tang pathology will be a shao shen chong tang pathology whether it was caused by covid whether it was caused by a patient you know being purged when they have a cold temperature whether it's caused by something else it's in that person that would be the same thing so it's kind of there were there were a lot of people saying like how do we treat this new disease it's like well actually from a chinese medical perspective it's not new so you, it did kind of expose a bit of that sort of thing and having to come up with new formulas like you saw the formulas coming out of china it was they they were throwing everything at it basically those formulas it was just mm -hmm. everything possible in those formulas throw it at the patient see what sticks you know um mm -hmm. whereas i found standard chang and form standard chang and approach very effective interesting you know my martial arts teacher used to say there's there's lots of different ways to to deal to deal with a body you mm -hmm. know either when you're moving it or when you're doing something to somebody else um but he was like but there isn't an infinite ways to deal with the body because the body is the same body and mm -hmm. so it works a particular way and yeah. that's it you know if you bend an arm one direction it's going to break there's, that's it is going to break <laughs> you yeah. know it's exactly of, that yeah 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 it's exactly that. like martial arts there are loads of different martial arts styles one which focus on different things but at the end of the day there are a few different variations of how to throw a punch but at the end of the day it's the same mechanics and you know you can look at how like some wing chun schools throw it out locking the elbow and how boxers mm -hmm. would do it differently but it's ultimately the same mechanics and when you stick two people in the ring they end up fighting the same no matter what they've trained but it's like those same principles because it's the same body that's working it's the same with with yeah. Chinese medicine, like, doesn't matter what's affecting it, it can only fail in certain ways. So, yeah, it can only fail in certain yeah. ways. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a... that's what Chinese medicine is about. It's about understanding how the body works, therefore understanding how it can fail, not understanding the external influence on it, because that's irrelevant. It's how the body's failing that, that we're trying to understand. So just to, I mean, you've just said this, but I feel like if I say it, then it'll also sink in best in my mind as well. Um, so this, it's neither here nor there to talk about newness then, if we're not focusing on pathology, but rather focusing on physiology. And if, so 
something pathologically could appear to be new, and that's another conversation, but if the main focus in this approach is physiology, replacing bits of it and so on, and making sure that function is restored to a system, then the, then conversations around new and newness then become ultimately like, yeah, neither here nor there. Is that then the point or? Um... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's how the, the body's failing. Like I say, in COVID, you saw certain stages in the pathology progression more emphasized and something's going very quickly to that area, but it, that was still exactly the same rules and ex still exactly the same steps you'd normally see. It was just more emphasized in people often affected with COVID. But yeah, it's exactly that. You're you're supporting the body's physiology, no matter what's caused that physiology to fail. So again, if if a disease has caused your center to cool off, that's going to be Ganjang method, no matter what that disease is. Because mm. that's that's what needs supporting. Mm. It's like you're driving your car and you hit a bump in the road and that like causes your wheel to fall off. You put a, need to put a new wheel on no matter what you hit. It doesn't matter yeah. what you, you you need to you still need to do the same thing with your car. You still need to rectify that in the same way. Right. So like the mechanic isn't going to go, so did you was it a tarmac road or was it a grassy bump or was it like it's like, no, my wheel fell off, I need a new wheel. You know, it's that kind of <laughs> right. right. That does remind me of my car a little bit. Um <laughs> Okay, Laurie, I uh, we we we've taken up a significant chunk of your life, and um, and we're we're very we're very grateful, and um, I think you know we've had a couple of conversations, and to be honest with you, a lot of things have become a lot clearer for me, and that's um, that's I think a that's I think a very hopeful thing, and you know we're talking to you as patients, but I think um the you know the the helpful thing is not only for patients i think the helpful thing is also for anybody who wants to learn to whatever degree i think sometimes patients become very interested in medicine you know mm -hmm. because they want to understand what's happening um and i think students i think i think patients and students will 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 benefit from just from your experience and then and i suppose your the clarity of your and the experience of your teachers right we this was a thing that came into this conversation N knowledge like this gets transferred um you didn't make all the stuff up you know <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> um but it's it's really been a pleasure getting it from you in 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 i suppose a as clear and coherent a way as you got it from 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 Dr. Versluis um, and 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 from his teachers, and so I just really personally want to sort of express my gratitude for that. Um, and I I assume Yasin is going to want to do the same, so I'll just let him do that now, and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, yeah, no, I mean um, that's uh, I mean it's, it's like I said, I, I'm also. Like uh, Walid said, uh, I mean, I'm very, very pleased. Um, it's such an elegant system, and to hear it so eloquently laid out is, um, it, I mean, I've not, I've, I've, I've never heard it presented in such an eloquent and simple and, and, and easy to understand way. And as a patient, um, it gives me a lot to think about. So yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure. So um, thank you uh, very much for your time. Um, and I, 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 I hope others will uh, benefit as much from from these sessions as Waleed and I have, and we'll continue to because we we'll continue to mine this for uh, for, for bits. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to say thank you to both of you as well. It's been it's been really good doing this, and it's just like it's been really good to 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 sort of talk about this from, you know, from the perspective of you guys as patients, but also who have started to look into Chinese medicine a bit. And like I, like I said in previous episodes, like your, your question of really being really excellent and really like, really sort of incisive, but also really broad and have, uh, yeah, and just your, your ability to kind of grasp Chinese, you know, the, the principles of Chinese medicine really quickly is quite astounding. And I think that the way you've asked the question has actually made it, I, I think there've been very good questions to, kind of make this accessible to people 
so yeah i just want to say thank you to you guys for that and i mean it is is true like you say like it's i'm only able to talk about these things because of, i've had very good teachers who are able to outline this and are able to like move things forward this far so i could kind of piggyback off that so uh yeah it's uh it's more down to them but no i think this is this is you know some brilliant brilliant questions you know to come up with and a brilliant sort of discussion we've had and like i say hopefully it will be helpful to people yes that's that that's also i think that's also our hope um in a number of ways understanding and also maybe um helping people um find which direction they want to go you know do they mm -hmm whether that's for studying or whether that's for sort of looking after their own health um, yeah and um i don't know i hope one thing has come out i know that in some ways i've sounded kind of a bit critical of tcm and so on i hope one thing that's kind of come out of this is not that not that i'm critical of tcm and such but it just that i hope people understand who are, like maybe people are going to study chinese medicine just the importance of finding a clear cohesive system like tcm i think is a good introduction but after that finding a clear system which which clicks with you because for example, TN lineage may click with some people, it may not with others, they may feel more affinity to another, but finding something where you practice systematically for a way, and it that doesn't have to be that way for the rest of your life, you can do that for a period of time, and then find something else, but just the focus, you're not, the one fear is, I think people feel they're going to be missing out if they don't study everything, you're actually not, you're going to be missing out if you try to study, every, if you try to study too much at once, so I hope what's come out of this is the need to find a, a cohesive system which you focus on for a period of time and that will give you a very very good base oh i absolutely agree and i think that's really good advice um and like i said i've seen i've seen i've seen tcm practitioners that are really good and i think that's what they've done yeah. i think that's yeah. what they've done um well ending on good advice is always good advice so i think we'll call that and and um and thank you and i hope we talk to you again yeah yeah i hope so